Welcome to the Be Better broadcast, where we bring you tips and strategies and techniques to help you bring your personal life to the next level, but also to help you bring your career, your business, and everything in your professional life to the next level as well. You know that we love to bring on experts and guests on this show that can help you to do just those things that I just mentioned. And today we have a very special guest. It's a very special guest because the guest today, Mr. Mike Verrett, he's a friend of mine. I met him several months ago through a mutual friend who was on the podcast. And as soon as I talked with Mike, we hit it off. And it's for many reasons. Mike has incredible energy. He has the experience to back up everything that he does with over 20 years in the advertising and marketing world. Absolutely extraordinary. But Mike loves to talk about how to perfectly craft your brand's message and how you can really share your message with your audience to create a deeper connection with your audience to finely tune and craft your elevator pitch and a bunch of other things that we're going to dive into today. But before we dive into it and before I introduce Mike, you always ask how you can support the broadcast. There's no ads, sponsorships, anything like that on this show. The only thing we ask is that throughout this conversation with Mike, when you take away any piece of value, which will probably happen in the first few minutes, share this show with one friend who could use that piece of advice. Share it with one person who could use what we're talking about today, because today we're going to talk about how you do what it is you do with the people who might not know about what you do to the deepest extent. And today we are speaking with Mr. Mike Verrett. And for those who don't know Mike, Mike has more than 20 years of experience in advertising and marketing, and his ability to understand and connect with an audience is the hallmark of his career. The approach that Mike shares is what taught him how to understand an audience and deliver his message in a way that they will not forget. Mike has spent 13 years in the agency world as a client services specialist before joining Hasbro Toys and Games on the global marketing team, where he developed marketing and retail programs for brands that you all know, such as Transformers, Tonka Trucks, and Jurassic World, all these brands that I grew up with. In 2015, he became the face of the Hasbro gaming franchise with the charge to establish the personality, attitude, and style of the Hasbro gaming portfolio by creating a message that the audience won't soon forget. After over 20 years of real world experience, Mike is thrilled to share his experience with you and to show you how to get your audience to say, tell me more. Mike, you got to tell me more, brother. Thanks so much for being on the show. Brandon, thank you so much for having me. I think it's some sort of cruel joke that we do this at 8 a.m. on a Monday, but <laughs> we're, we're going to see how it rolls out, right? It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. We're going to have a good time. So this is one thing that's really interesting to me is I recently dove into the world of networking. Okay. And it sounds weird to say that because I've been in sales for forever, Mike, and I've been networking all along, but not intentionally networking. And something that I found very quickly, and it was with myself too, until I met you and started working on these things myself, is most people don't know how to talk about what they do. Okay. Whether you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or even someone who's an employee at a company, someone asks them, well, what, what is it that you do? Right. And they, they name off and rattle off some long job title that the person across from them has no idea what the heck that they're talking about. So as we know, many people need help with this area, right? That's why you do what you do. So let me ask you this. When you work with individuals, what mistakes are you generally seeing most businesses or entrepreneurs or anyone make when it comes to explaining what it is they do? What are the common mistakes you see? That is a fantastic leading question for a Monday morning. Um, <laughs> I, what I most often see, and it comes from a place, let's just start sort of the point of arrival here. Your business is 100% important to you, every aspect of it. And that's especially important when it's a small business, right? Big businesses have departments and they can all take care of things. But when it's you, it's being driven by passion anyway, right? Yeah. The challenge becomes 100% of what's important to you. Only about 2% of that is important to your audience. And when it's your business, it's really hard to see, you know, the cliche, see the forest for trees because you're working on what's important to you. So to put that into practice, more often than not, if I hear a new business pitch or if I visit a website where I feel I see that the messaging may need help or need clarity, 
is when they're leading with their services mm -hmm. or leading about a feature that's important to them. The challenge with that is you haven't attached any meaning to your services or to that feature that's important to you. Yeah. Your audience is seeing it for the first time. So what do you want that first impression to look like? How do you want to connect with them? Because the fact of the matter is your service, your brand, your product, your message is only as strong as your connection, the audience's connection with that message. Otherwise, they don't see the value the way you do. So you find yourself perhaps saying, I have to talk to multiple audiences, or I need to have a website, Facebook, TikTok, email campaign. You almost feel like you're going through a to-do list. Mm -hmm. And that's when your key message gets sacrificed because every business should have one message, one. How they deliver that message is tactical. That's just a boat that carries the message across the water, whether it's Facebook or an email campaign or even your website. And to keep an eye on the key message, where you start and what you connect your audience with and how you take them through your full story, your full message, right to the call to action is the most important thing you can do for your business. That is fascinating to me. The whole idea of most people start and they lead with their services and they lead with their product. So I'm all about practicality. So do you mind if we use like an actual example? Just absolutely. Uh, I speak in I speak in examples all the time. <laughs> explain things. So let's say we have a small business owner who they offer soaps. Okay. They have soaps, they have like other, you know, skincare products and stuff like that. And they're at, you know, a marketing event and and they're talking with other people about what it is they do, right? How would someone with the limited information that we have, very limited, obviously, what would that individual talk about rather than talk about their soaps and their products and how that can help them? Where should that person lead with in that conversation? Well, <clears throat> the first thing to understand is you're there selling soap. That's a product or service, but there are a lot of different kinds of soap. And you need to understand what a soap audience would be looking for, right? So how do you relate to that audience? Are you selling soap or are you selling soft, clean hands? Are you selling mm. a detergent that's made of all of these things and it's natural and biodegradable? Or are you selling germ-free in the classroom? What you're attaching yourself to has more to do with the human impulse around it, right? So take uh somebody just shared an example with me talking about different brands and what they actually represent and one of the examples was rolex and the point of the discussion of the post i mean was rolex doesn't sell watches they sell status mm. the brand supreme which is a streetwear brand that's very perceived as very exclusive they don't sell sweatshirts they sell scarcity Mm. And what you're selling is actually something that the audience attaches to. A plumber, for instance, is not selling water system services. They're selling a cure to the panic when water starts coming through your ceiling. Yeah. They're attaching to an emotional piece, something that's very human. And I tell people I got my master's in human nature and common sense by <laughs> managing in a bar and bartending for a handful of years because it all comes down to their perception of what you're saying it's not what problem does my business solve it's how does my audience perceive that solution and if it's not on their terms they can move right on the danger of marketing these days brandon and getting your brand out there in the way that you want it to your audience is understanding that your audience has one way of searching now like it's not tv advertising a newspaper or radio from the 80s it's Google. Mm. They need something. They go to Google, they type it in. So imagine if I'm searching for a public relations firm because I run a business and I want to get my word out the right way. I'm going to put in PR firm, let's say, and it's mm -hmm. going to return in a tenth of a second, a hundred results. Then all I have to do is slide my mouse back and forth and click. I am looking for what resonates with me. And if it doesn't resonate with me, I move to the next one. So imagine when I search a PR firm and everything that shows up, the first three results that show up say, we're a PR firm. If you're the <laughs> audience 
and you just searched for a PR firm and the first thing you see is that they've hit the lowest common denominator of your expectations. Yeah. But if the fourth one says every business has trouble talking about themselves, we'll help you find the right words. We're a PR firm. Mm -hmm. Now they've aligned with the challenge that you're going through when you went there in the first place. Why you were searching on Google is what that PR firm decided to align to. Not that they can get your word out because they're a PR firm. Wow. So it's not necessarily about selling the solution to the problem, which is what we're told so often. We're always told, like, like you mentioned, like, you know, you sell the result, not what the product actually is, right? Like I offer coaching programs, I offer workshops and six week experiences, but I'm not selling that. I'm selling that they're going to leave these experiences with more momentum that they've built. They're going to leave with being more productive, which allows them to advance in their career. But even at that point, that still makes me the same as everybody else who's offering these same programs. And this is a roadblock that I've personally run into a lot. So you're saying it's not about the result. It's about the perception of my audience. And does this tie right into your approach on the whole first, best, or different? Do those two things tie in? Because when it comes to someone who's in like a space of his coaching, and a lot of people in this audience, Mike, they're, you know, they're between the age of 25, 35, a lot of salespeople who are selling a product. So it's very applicable to them. A lot of entrepreneurs, but mostly in that entrepreneurial space, it's coaches, consultants, and content creators who run into the struggle of why them versus another person who's in this space who might've been doing it for one month longer, therefore more quote unquote experience. So mm -hmm. how can someone in a space such as life coach or content creator follow this first best or different approach? How would you guide someone like that through that space? Well, especially in those three C's you mentioned, the coach, consultant, and content creator, the first thing to acknowledge is first and best aren't an option. <laughs> you're not going to be the first and best is hard to come by right so you got to be first best or different if first and best is a one percent kind of opportunity that gives you 99 percent of the opportunity is going to be how to stand out how to differentiate yourself from what else is out there and that's where the focus becomes so let me give you let me give you an example of how i look at different okay because different doesn't mean you have to be zany you have to have a crazy logo you need to use all video to sell what you do different is all in the eye of the audience of the beholder right so different could be as simple as that example i just gave you about the pr firm where you're talking about what's important to them and everybody else is talking about what's important to that business they're saying we're a PR firm because they think SEO, we need to line up with SEO. We need to have our layout and what we say aligned so people, when they search for us, can find it. It's not what they're going to attach to. So ultimately, what you're looking at is the easiest litmus test in the world is search your service and look at the first five results that come up. And my I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say 100% certainty because it's about 95% risk mitigation, but 95% certain that when you do that, you are immediately going to see similarities in the first five results. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see people saying the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's based on value. Sometimes it's based on I could do this because of my experience. Sometimes it's based on they're really persuasive with how they're communicating it, but it's always the same story. What is the need state of the person looking for a coach, for instance? They're trying to figure something out from an academic level. And I look at everything like this math, math class in, let's say, high school, where it's comprehension or even elementary school. It's comprehension and application. Two plus two equals four. How do you apply that to figure out the speed a train is moving from Chicago to San Francisco? So when people are looking for a coach or a consultant they're looking to learn they're looking to figure out how to take that next step mm -hmm. what they're getting hooked on is application they can absorb from an academic standpoint all the time but what they're absorbing is a bunch of other people's thinking and mm -hmm. a bunch of other people's systems do this and you'll see 10 times growth 
use my foolproof system for database marketing. All of these things become somebody else's system. And what they end up doing is they understand the system and they use it. They use it exactly as it is. What those systems don't take into consideration, for instance, is what's going to happen if I'm nothing like that person? What if that yeah. person's whole system is based on the fact that they're an extrovert and I'm an introvert? How do I apply it to me? That's the ultimate goal, right? So let's go back to the idea of you're looking for this service. The first five comparatively are all saying, I'm a coach, I'll get you to where you need to be. I have the experience, 30 years in business, blah, blah, blah. Did any of them say, I can teach you stuff, but the most important thing I could do is show you how to apply it to your business. Mm. Nobody talks about it that way. They talk about the coach as I, I, I. This is what I can do for you. But recognizing the challenges, you could read 100 textbooks. Are you able to apply what you learn in the textbook? No, you're not. Yeah. That's what it comes down to for me, especially in the coaching consultant space, where it's going to be about, trust me, I have experience doing this. And even the way you read my, my bio makes it sound like I've got 20 some odd years of experience in marketing. But at the end of the day, I know one thing an audience and that's it. And if I can understand your audience, then I can understand how you need to reach me and I can help you clarify what that message is. If I don't understand your audience, then I'm just gonna be responding to here's your services and I don't see anything different. But you're always talking to your audience. So let me, let me um, illustrate that point for you with an example. Please. We needed to sell I can't remember if we talked about this or not, but certainly not on this call. We needed to sell at Hasbro more Monopoly games. And mm. everybody knows the game Monopoly is something you buy once for, say, $15 US, and you keep it for 20 years. It's not a frequency purchase. It's not a luxury purchase. You replace the pieces if you lose them. So how the heck do you get people to buy more Monopoly? Well, we could go out the door and run specials. We could add money or cool tokens or whatever, some sort of Easter egg style promotion. But what we really wanted to do was figure out how do we connect people to Monopoly on their terms in a new way. So we're looking at research and on one page from our insights team, they have a buzz, just a clipping from a Buzzfeed article, Buzzfeed poll, 50% of people cheat when they play Monopoly. <laughs> and the most fascinating thing happened. There's 15 adults in this room and every single one of them for five minutes was talking about cheating or playing with someone who cheated. This is fascinating, we said. We have an idea. Two weeks later, we get in front of the C-suite where you got the CEO, CMO, see everybody's there, 50 people in the presentation hall to present what's next with Monopoly. First slide, 50% of people cheat when they play Monopoly. Five minutes, everybody including the front table, talked about cheating or playing <laughs> someone who cheated. So we had them aligned on an interesting idea that meant something to all of them. They talked about it on an individual terms. The next slide introduced Cheaters Edition Monopoly, mm -hmm. where the whole objective was to get away with cheating. And if you got caught, we added an 18-inch plastic handcuff to the go-to-jail case. <laughs> you literally got handcuffed to the board. But it was bought and sold because we got everyone in the audience thinking about that exact thing on a personal level. And it's like your audience, if I asked everyone in your audience to think about Santa Monica Beach, Santa Monica Pier in Los Angeles, everyone would have a postcard idea of what I'm talking about. They'd mm -hmm. see a pier, a Ferris wheel, sand, water. But if I said to you and all of your listeners, think of a beach, when I say that, every single one of you goes to a personal place and it starts to elicit memories, smell, taste, what you heard, what you saw, who you were with, music playing. If my next word out of my mouth is remember when you got sunburned and a beach umbrella would have been great. Now everybody's thinking about getting sunburned and not having a beach umbrella and I'm ready to sell them beach umbrellas. Wow. I'm trying to get them aligned to an idea that they can't escape. And that's the key. If you can align with your audience and get them to think about something that's just true to them, they're going to keep reading. They're going to be intrigued and want to know more. 
And that's the goal of any good message for a business is how do you capture their attention and bring them all the way through to your call to action without losing their attention? It's always on their terms and not yours. And it's a hard, hard thing to do, especially when it's your own business. Wow. Because we're so focused on us versus being focused on them, right? It's about talking about their pain points. I remember when I first got a coach a while ago, the first thing he recommended, which no one recommended to me, now I see it everywhere, but at the time it was brand new and it's survey your audience, like ask them what they want and then create your product based on what they want. And I thought to myself, like, that is so simple. Like, why mm. have I never thought about that's easy? Like I was sitting here like, okay, what did I do in my life? Okay. Well, what is it that I wanted to know? Me, 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 I, I, I versus just asking people, Hey, you know, what's the number one thing you're struggling with right now? And right. every time I do this, Mike, I think it's going to be one thing, but really it's another thing. Like I always think it's going to be, Oh, well, Brandon, I don't know what I want. I don't have clarity. I don't have a goal, but it's usually in, in the, in the coaching space, life coaching, it's always, well, I want to be more productive with my time. Well, I want to feel more motivated to do the things that I know that I should do. So literally like the bulk of my message now is let me help you be more productive with your time so that you can accomplish this, this, and this. So I, hundred percent relate to what you're talking about here. And I still have a ways to go to get better, but I'm curious speaking on this whole idea of different, right? Let's talk about you specifically. Okay. So, <laughs> I, so you weren't first to the space, right? No. Some might say that you're the best in the space, right? Some might say that, but I'm going to guess that in your mind, you're not saying I'm the best in the space, right? So I'm guessing that you had to go with different. So what did you create in your mind that is what is different about the way that your audience perceives you? What's different? That um, uh, the only people who think I'm best are probably my mom and dad. At this point, <laughs> I'm fairly certain. I don't think I've been around long enough to claim anything like that. But coming into it as a consultant, it's formative, right? It's it's a uh, it's all based on what you did to get there. So it's based on experience, right? It's not learning; it's doing. I spent a lot of time in my career learning and on the agency side, when I was in the account service role for say a marketing firm or an ad agency, I felt like I was in my element because I understood the people I was talking to and I understood how to connect with them and listen to their challenges and what's their motivation for what they want to do. But I found myself always paying attention to who I was talking with and figuring out how to communicate with the best. A lot of this came from the fact that I just have social anxiety. I'm not a huge fan of big crowds. And it used to be if I got in front of an audience to present, it was just a nightmare. I mean, it was torment. And I'm sure everyone can relate to that. Uh, presenting people rank it above death and being struck by lightning when you have to present to an audience. Yeah. There's, a, there's just an irrational fear in it, okay? So my way of overcoming it was to focus only on the audience and think only of the audience. And if I'm always paying attention to them, I'm not paying attention to me. So I made that sort of my survival instinct because I constantly was in meetings where I was presenting or group presentations. And that allowed me to get out of my own head and focus on what mattered. Are these people understanding what I'm saying? Mm. So if I'm paying attention to the audience and I see a bunch of blank faces, I'm not doing it right. And I'm reacting to that on the spot because I need to make sure the audience is paying attention. So fast forward to my years post advertising, when I was hired onto the global brand team, the management organization at Hasbro, I started out on Transformers and it was a dream come true. I'm a kid of the eighties. Optimus Prime is one of my heroes. I got to meet the voice of Optimus Prime and wow. I'd go to dinner with them. I had just really cool experiences. And that's what I thought it was going to be like. This is great. I'm leveraging my skills of, you know, working with people collaboratively, solving problems, figuring out communication. What great. Then I moved on to Jurassic World and it turns into just a process because all we were doing was making plastic dinosaurs for a licensee, Universal Studios, who made the movie. And what I saw was we may have been making trash, may as well have been making trash bin liners, pencils, anything. It was just a process and I found no reward in that. 
Mm. My only claim to fame Jurassic on Jurassic World was I named one of the dinosaurs in the movie. I got to name Indominus Rex, uh, the big white dinosaur in the film. Reason yeah. being, originally he was named Diabolus Rex. And our PR team searched and sent us this panic email saying, you have to look this up. The only image that came up was a picture of the outgoing president of the Church of Satan who went by Diabolus <laughs> Rex. And he had horn implants, black contacts, a beard. It was not a good scene if you're selling plastic dinosaurs to three and four year olds and mom is searching for them. It was going to be a problem. So we brought this to their attention. Their response was, just give us another name. Hollywood magic at work. <laughs> So I'm thinking the script writers do that stuff, not the toy maker. So I go on, I go into a uh, conference room. I write the word Rex on the board and I just write a bunch of words from a Latin dictionary that looked cool next to Rex. And I landed on Indominus because it meant unconquerable. And I had put together a 15 minute presentation to show Universal on why. Slide two is the new name. They go, okay, great, thanks. And the call was over. All they needed was a name. But the way I looked at it is I got to put my stamp on Hollywood. But that was the highlight of the two years I worked on Jurassic World. I was miserable. And it's mm. because I wasn't using what I did best. My ability to communicate, to understand the why of an audience and not just the what. And that becomes important in business. It's not just what they want, it's why. It's their motivation for needing it that really ties to what your message needs to connect to. So I was moved to Hasbro Games and my role became face of Hasbro Games. 40% of my year was spent flying around the world presenting Hasbro games to our audiences, whether it was internal summit, uh, a trade show or a toy fair that we're selling to the buyers who actually are our customer or to consumers at, at big consumer events. I was who they engaged with and I ate it up. I loved trying to figure out all the audiences and make sure our message was delivered the right way. So the other 60% of the time I was still a brand manager and I didn't like it. So I was seeing half success and half meh. When I left Hasbro in 2018, at the I was let go as part of a work reduction, a workforce reduction, because numbers were down. It's a big company effect. I was at the point before I was let go where I was looking for a job back at an agency or at another brand. Those were the two opportunities I thought I had because I wanted to get out of what I was doing. When I was let go, I hugged the VP when she called me into her office. Wow. It must have been a hell of a spectacle for people watching, but <laughs> I realized in that moment that I was given free reign to decide what to do next. So it gave me a little bit of time to think about what I'm best at and how I could use that. Mm. And I used that as my launch point. The one thing I know is an audience and how to communicate with them on their terms, how to connect a message to them. So if I can do that for a business's audience, I mean, for a business, show them how to talk about their audience. <laughs> Let me try again. Monday morning. <laughs> if I could show a business how to talk to their audience on their terms and connect their message to them the right way, they're going to see more success. That drives sales. That's bottom line results. So what I do becomes very important. That's what I built my business for, showing you how to talk about yourself and showing you the perils of focusing on just what you think is valuable and what you think is important and how quickly that can make you look like everybody else to the audience. So how do you differentiate yourself? How do you clarify your message to connect with your audience and take them through your story the right way so they understand the value and you stand out? So wow. that's my long 20 year story of how I got there and I had some fun experiences on the way, but in the end, I figured out when I was 45 years old what I'm best at. And that is how do you speak to an audience on their terms? So that's what I decided to turn my business into. I haven't looked back. I'm enjoying it thoroughly. I meet people from all over the world and everybody needs to know how to do it. It's not something where if you can't do it, your business is gonna fail. Yes. The audience is the only thing that matters. And if they don't attach to you, if they don't connect to you the right way, then you're wasting all the work that you've done. It's so true. And, and what a wild ride you've been on. And it's just so interesting how everything that happened in your life led you to the next thing and then to the next thing. And then to eventually you discovering at 45 what your gift is and helping everyone else apply that in their business. And I, I love how your idea of different 
is in itself different from what other people's idea of different is. And the fact that your idea of different is, I, I think, you know, the presupposition here that we, we keep assuming is that everyone listening already has pinpointed who their audience is. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, especially new coaches that I like to work with, they have no idea of the audience they want to reach to them. It's well, my, my whole Facebook friends list is my audience, right? Everyone on my social media. And while some of them might be interested and while your audience can branch out into different segments, your audience, you, you really have to have a strong idea of who your audience is. So speaking of the audience, right? You talked about how being different is really speaking to them and their wants and needs and what they want. If you were working with me as an example, where, what, 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 what do I need to know about my audience, Mike? in order for me to speak their language? Like what are, are there like key points that I need to understand innately? Like what does it look like for me to understand my audience? Well, it's almost like trying to have an out of body experience, right? If you've seen the movie, um, uh, Dr. Strange from Marvel, there's a scene where he's on a hospital bed and he comes out and he's looking at everything from sort of a, an outside perspective. And it, it's funny, it reminds me of how my son learned to play soccer. He was very good about knowing where to be and what his role was and which way he was supposed to run and kick and pass the ball. But I came to find out when he was six or seven years old, I started paying attention to the or eight, whatever age it was. He was playing FIFA soccer on Xbox hmm. and it gave him a view of the entire field. So he knew where each player was supposed to go. He knew he could see it all unfolding and that's what he was applying. He even told me this. That's what he was applying when he was playing soccer. Wow. He took a second. To, he was seeing it from an uh, an aerial perspective, almost like when we're watching, say, the NFL on TV. The camera's showing you everything. But imagine being the running back. You can't see anything. You're depending on guys to push other people out of the way, and you don't know what's coming next necessarily. But the audience does because we're watching it unfold. So the first step is trying to take yourself outside of your own business and put yourself in the shoes of your audience and ask the question about motivation. Why are they looking? Why are they looking for a coach? What is their need state in their mind at that time? Clearly something isn't working and the human condition says, I need to learn how to do this. Mm. That's what we do. So, it's really about attaching to why they're looking for a coach or why they would look for a coach in the first place. It's not about they're looking for a coach, so I'm gonna give them coach things. It's why would they even need me in the first place? And if you could be direct with that and, and hone in on that, it starts to change how you talk to them. So instead of be more productive, it becomes your life feels all over the place right now. You're running in a million directions. What you need is focus. And that's what a coach can do. A coach can bring you around focus, give you structure, give you standard operating procedure to manage those rocky waters, let's say. So that's where their need state originates is something's off and I need help. And many coaches rely on the fact that they've just got experience in the real world, which is incredibly valuable. But if you could speak to the audience in a way that says, what I learned in the real world, I also learned how to apply to you. This isn't just me talking about my experience. It's me seeing what you're going through and helping you to manage that. Whatever it is, marketing, organization, operations, finance, doesn't matter. The experience that you're bringing to bear means something to them if you communicate it the right way. I've made all the mistakes you have. I'm going to show you how to avoid them. Wow. How you're relating directly to their need state. And that's that's the trick is if you understand where they're at, then it becomes much easier to say, here's what you're going through. Here's how I solve that. Here's my process. Let's talk. Wow. I love everything that you just said, like about <laughs> understanding their need state. And I love how you just took that productivity example. And thank you for that. And you took that productivity example, but you dug in deeper to how it is they're feeling. Now, a lot of 99% of what you're talking about is not the, the pain point necessarily, but it's the pain itself and the pain that the pain point is causing the person, like the lack of 
productivity, right? They're running all over the place. They have no idea what to do. They've got their family, their job. They feel completely disassembled in their life. But what if instead you could focus and you could have that clarity and you had the feeling like you knew what you were going to do next, like the feeling that your life was together. Or when people say as an example that they lack motivation, right? Well, what does that lack of motivation cause you to feel like? It causes you to feel like you're not doing enough. It causes Mm -hmm. you to feel like there's more you could be doing, but you're just not sure how. So it's really digging in and and really making people, when they hear the message, it makes them instead say, oh, wow, that sounds exactly like what I'm going through right now. Right. And think about the word you use, pain point. A point is a fixed point, right? It doesn't move around. By definition, a pain point is a fixed spot. More often than not, that pain point is the catalyst for I need help. It's already happened is my point. If you're talking about the pain point, you're not taking into consideration how they got to that point. Mm. And that's where the slower burn is. So when they get to their pain point, it's I need help. And that's when they're ready to reach out. If you can answer why they hit that pain point, what led them to needing help, now you're thinking more in terms of what got them there and and they're going to be more receptive. If you're talking about just the pain point, the decision time, your message is going to be, you need a coach. I can help you. But if you think about what led up to it, your productivity is lacking. You're not as profitable as what you want to be. You feel all over the place. That's probably why you were looking for a coach. Mm-hmm. Now you've immediately aligned with what they were going through and what got them to their pain point in the first place. Yeah, no, it's it's a very, it's a very succinct path, right? Mm-hmm. When you're working with people, do you ever find yourself having to help people pinpoint who their audience really is? Is that something that you work with people on or is that like a, you need to know this before they come to you? Like what, what does it look like when you're helping someone? H- how do you do that? How do you help someone determine who their audience should be or who their audience is? That's a fantastic question because, and it is something that I run into a lot and many businesses do is I have to talk to this person about this. I have to talk to this person about this. I have to talk to this person about this. And what they allow to happen is it becomes three different messages. Mm. But that is a service-based, what can I provide approach to thinking about it, right? It's, It's always going to end up being, well, if I have to talk to this person about this service, I have to do it this way on this platform. And they start to think of it in silos. But you don't start a business with three different audiences. You know, I mean, you're not reaching out to three different people with one business. That would be three different businesses almost or three different categories of your business. You started your business with one impulse. And if that impulse, that passion doesn't come through at the top, it doesn't matter who you think your audience is, you're not going to connect to them. So let's take the example. Let's take an example of. Okay, I got a good one. Plumbing again. I'm going back to plumbing. I worked with the company, uh, I think it was two years ago now, and was working with their sales team on how to smooth out what they were selling. And what they were selling was water filtration systems. Okay, so it goes into a home, and the idea is that the water that's coming through goes through this system, and you no longer have hard water or, you know, brownish tint, whatever may come from, say, the municipal water supply. This cleans it all out, okay? They're going to wholesale plumbing supply warehouses and speaking to plumbers once a month, Mm. talking to the plumbers about how water filtration works. Then they're going to consumers and they've got a different message about what to look for. And they've got a different message for the plumbing supply warehouse owner or manager. Three different things that they're talking about. Spending an hour with plumbers telling them how water filtration works struck us as a wild waste of time okay at the end of the day what we had to do was back up and say okay water filtration what does that look like to the consumer the consumer first of all plumbing problems are the worst they just need to be fixed i don't care what's wrong i don't care how to fix it i just want it fixed because water's coming through my walls through Mm. my ceiling it's immediate you don't have that same reaction if the power goes out 
But if the water's gone, you've got a big problem. And if the water's coming into your house in a way that it's not supposed to, and that system's broken, you panic as a consumer, right? So now let's put ourselves in the shoes of a plumber who goes to answer one of those calls. Now the call could be about, I have water that's brown, blah, blah, blah. They go in, they look at the system, and one of the things they see is like staining around the joints or something that indicates hard water or a water problem, lime, anything like that. They're not gonna to explain to the person how it works. They're gonna say, you've got, this is the water quality issue. This is what you need as a water filtration system. Great, seems pretty straightforward. They don't need to explain to the audience how it works. They don't need to explain, they already know how it works, so we don't need to explain it to them. So what do you do to smooth out the consumer transaction and tie in the plumbers and the plumbing supply warehouse? Plumbing supply warehouse wants to sell more water filtration. Mm -hmm. Plumbers want to do the job and get out, and if they can make money off of it, great. Consumers want the water to stop. So what we created was once a month, 10 minutes with the plumbers. Here's what to look for. When you see it, you know it. We have the best solution. Here's a stack of cards. When you recommend to them, you have hard water or lime, I recommend a water filtration system. This is the one I'd recommend. Call me and I'll come and put it in. That's it. That's all that the plumber needs to do. Wow. The other 50 minutes of that monthly meeting, instead of talking to the plumbers about how water filtration works, you spend 50 minutes talking to the plumber supply warehouse manager about an incentive program. Everything starts with hard water through the perception of the audience, of the consumer. They want it fixed. The plumber gives them the right solution. The plumbing supply warehouse gets the benefit of providing the right solution. We've aligned all three audiences with one thing around hard water and water filtration. Wow. And that was, was that a real life example that you've, you've helped somebody with? Yeah, it was two years ago. Wow. What a fascinating example. I, I like how what you said too, is the client doesn't need to know how everything works. And I think that's important in every industry, every industry. I've worked with thousands of salespeople, Mike, and they're just talking about how everything works. Like they're talking about this spec. And especially I worked with a lot of people in the cell phone world and the person who wants a cell phone, they're saying, I want a phone that will make calls. I want it to have a nice camera and I want it to have a big screen. And you've got the sales representative over here like, oh, it's got the Snapdragon A4 processor with the 90 megapixel lens. And it's like, they don't need to know that. They simply want to know that based on your expertise as the expert in this field, this is the best thing for them. Don't bore them with the techno babble and the facts that aren't important to them. So I think that that's really important when you said too about the plumber is not going to explain all the nuances and all the things like that to the client because they, the audience doesn't care about that. They just want their water system. <laughs> I mean, that's, and, and we, we have a habit when it's our business, we have a habit focusing on, focusing on the features that we feel make it unique, but there is nothing worse for a salesperson, for marketing organizations, nothing worse than being excited about something and not getting that excitement in return from your audience. You yeah. think that Z9 processor is what makes the phone and all they care about is how easy it is to hit to text back. Yeah. So you need to take a moment and think about do those features, those services, are they going to care as much as I do? Yeah. And if I want them to care as much as I do, then how do I get them attached to the reason why they should care? It's all about the motivation of the audience and what they experience. It's got nothing to do with your services. Well said. You said so many things that have helped me pinpoint even my audience more through this conversation. So I know that if I'm getting this out of this conversation, I can't imagine what people listening are getting out of this. One of my final questions for you before I ask how people can get in touch with you, because I know you're offering free clarity calls with people to talk about these exact things, which we'll talk about where they can find that. But my question for you is, if you had to give one small tip to somebody that would make a big difference when it comes to better connecting with their audience. What's the small tip that would make a big difference? Oh, this is a good one. So uh, my whole process is revolved, it revolves around the idea of your elevator pitch. And I'm sure everyone who's listening is thinking of a 10 second statement that you give about what you do 
you've got businesses like story brands, companies like story brand that people turn to all the time. And it's almost like a fill in the blank exercise. Mm. And here's what, here's what I would say in that construct, when you're talking about what you do and you say exactly what you do, your audience actually attaches meaning to that. If I came on and said, I'm a, if I was in an elevator with you, Brandon, the first thing mm -hmm. I said, if you ask me what I do is I'm a brand strategist that helps businesses better communicate with their audience to drive sales. That sounds very story brand. And I use the term brand strategist. You immediately, whether you want to or not attach meaning to that. We do it all the time. If I say brand strategist, your idea of a brand strategist is now in your head. Yeah. Okay. That's 10 seconds gone as far as I'm concerned, because you mm -hmm. remembered maybe three words of it and you have a general idea of what I do. Yeah, I don't but know what that is. So it, it exactly. doesn't have any relevance to me. But it's not speed data. It's not 10 seconds and I have to get my point across. OK, it's about creating connection through intrigue, almost absence of information. So if somebody asks me what I do, I never tell them I'm a communication marketing communication specialist or a brand strategist. The only thing I say is I show you how to talk about yourself. And I am immediately and invariably get the look of what do you mean? And it creates an opportunity for me to answer that. What do you mean question? So for me, an elevator pitch is not 10 seconds on the first floor, the first floor is the first of six in your message. Mm -hmm. If you can create a connection with them and get them to ask more, if they wanna know, if I were in PR again, I love the example of PR evidently, if I'm on an elevator with you and I say, I'm a PR executive or I have a PR firm, you've already assumed you know what I do. If I tell you I make news, you're left with wondering what I mean. It creates this need for more information. Are you a reporter? Are you in PR? Are you an unruly gossip celeb who ends up on the uh, gossip page? Are you an unruly celeb who ends up on gossip pages? I just don't know yet. And if the next thing you tell me is what the challenge is and who experiences it, then I'm aligned. I'm starting to align with who you're talking to in an ads context. Mm. And if I introduce on the third floor of my elevator, the solution and the fourth floor, the process and the fifth floor, your services, how you deliver, and the sixth floor is the call to action. I've now taken them through a narrative where I've grabbed their attention, explained wow. why I'm important to them, how I solve their problem, and what it's worth for them to get in touch. And that in that itself is what is every a business That's what it is. And it should be the anchor point of your message all the time. That's what I mean. If it's your website, sales presentation, wow. or what you say on an elevator, it'll never vary. I never tell anybody anything else. I tell them that one thing to start and I take them through the floors of my elevator pitch. And what it creates is a message that attaches to the audience in a way that they process information. Easiest example is reading an FAQ page. The good ones are written from most general to most specific because that's the way we think. What is it? What do I need to know next? What do I need to know next? What do I need mm -hmm. to know next? That's how my elevator operates. It's six floors that thinks like your audience in terms of how it's communicating and make sure that your message attaches to them and connects to them in the right way. And it also makes sure that you're connecting and attaching to the right people, because if it's not the right person, after you say the first part, it's like, if they say, okay, well, that that's really cool, right? Then you know it's not the person who you even want to have that conversation with. But when you do have the person who says, okay, well, tell me more, what, what does that look like? I could use something like that. Then you keep going. You continue to determine, is this my ideal client? Is this someone I want to work with? Can I serve them? Can I help them? What a... Everyone, you need to rewind and you need to write <laughs> down those floors and you need to insert what you do into it because that was in two minutes, absolutely a small tip that will make a giant difference with what it is you do. Thanks for that. That's a very awesome how you laid out that framework there. Now they're going to lay out the framework, Mike, right? And they're going to say, wow, like this looks already so much better than what I've been doing. And all I did was listen to a 50 minute podcast that helped me to, you know, <laughs> become much more clear and concise with my message. But then they're going to say, everyone listening, well, I want to take this deeper. I want to take this to the next level to get even more results, right? So what does it look like for someone to reach out and work with you, Mike? They can find you at verettenassociates.com. And, and yep, what does a clarity call look like? Visit me there. 
Uh, it's very simple, very conversational, and really just finding out what you do. Um, it's it, it's risk free, and and more often than not, I can give people some insights on their message just on the the complimentary call. I always have a problem with that complimentary versus free, because yeah. consumer psychology says don't use free, but at the same time, it's free. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I know if I could get somebody on a call, I can typically be pretty influential and insightful with their business. So that's what I try to drive. Um, ultimately, working with me has to be fast. Reason being, if this is your message, you need to get this right. That means everything else is held up, whether it's your website, your sales pitch, whatever your marketing campaign is, your sales process is, this needs to happen first. So working with me is three weeks. That's it. It's first call is identifying what that entry point is, how we connect to your audience. The second call a week later is reviewing the outline or wireframe of your message to make sure we're aligned. The third meeting is going through your message together to make sure that everything's exactly how we want it and you're on your way. And the output is you could hand it to a web developer. You could use it as your sales pitch. You could use it as the basis for an email campaign. It's always the same message. I look at all those things like sales pitch, website. Those are all just tactics. Those are the ships that carry your message. And the other thing that I provide is the three things that you should be doing from a marketing standpoint. If we know your audience and how to talk to them, then we can identify the three best things to do. And if you stay true to those three things, that's where you're going to be able to see success and profit getting that message. That's powerful. That's a power. Thanks for laying out the process too. Step one, two, three. I love it. Now we can find Mike, everyone at verettandassociates.com. I have the link right in the description. Click the link. You'll see the clarity call at the top right and also right in the center of the screen. Click that, schedule a call with Mike. He'll bring it through his process and you'll have a message that all of your different ships can carry to do what it is that you want to do, which ultimately is to make a difference, right? It's to serve other people, help other people. The more clear your message is and the more clear what you're saying to your audience is, the more lives you're going to impact and the bigger difference you're going to make. Speaking of difference, my final question for you, Mike, is what is the positive impact that you want to make in the world during this chapter of your life? Honestly, what I have found in the past year of doing this, especially, but the past two years, is I have the opportunity to help small businesses, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs get off their feet and go in the right direction. And to that end, I've found nothing more rewarding. Where I really enjoy what I do and how I help people seeing the result. And that's why I like the idea of the free the free call is even on that call, if I can help someone, I get, uh, that is joy for me. Mm. It, tickles, it tickles me silly. If I could help somebody else, even if it's just a 10 minute conversation. So the impact I wanna make from a business, from a quality of life perspective, I totally enjoy working in my basement here at Verrett Associates <laughs> headquarters. So, and you know, my family, I see a lot more of my family and I'm able to spend more time with them than I ever did when I was in corporate America and an agency life. So a lot of those things are rewarding personally, but from a business perspective, I feel like I landed on something that everybody needs and it really makes a difference. And every time I see the difference that just reaffirms that I'm doing what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I wanted to be when I, when I grew up until I was 45 years old. But all of that was based on experiences that I've had and figuring out what my strength was or what my, I think you called it superpower or whatever it was. It took doing. It's not reading a book. It's seeing how you can apply what you're best at to help people. And after 45 years, you know, 25 years of being in marketing, I feel like I finally have that thing that helps people. So every time that I see it, it brings personal accomplishment type of feelings, but it also is the reward of helping these small businesses because I am one. And I know how hard it is to talk about what you do. I had to hire somebody to do it for me because I was too close to it. You should have seen what my initial things were like, don't pay overhead, call Mike instead. I was trading on value and I sounded <laughs> like a, I sounded like a personal injury attorney, but I had to hire someone who had a perspective of who I'm talking to and actually talk to a couple of my clients and myself to figure it all out. So everybody goes through it. And I think if I can help small businesses and people like me get off the ground and head in the right direction, then that brings a lot of 
personal satisfaction, my, my career oriented side of life. And you know, the beautiful thing about what you're doing too, is you're helping small businesses to reach their audience, but you're helping them to share the value and, and transform lives. So you're helping them transform their lives, but you're also reaching every audience of every small business. And then people in that audience go off and do the same thing. So the trickle effect and the ripple effect that you're creating in the world is absolutely incredible. But I commend you for the passion in which you talk about what you do. I commend you for your optimism. I commend you for even saying that it took you so long to really determine what you wanted to do with life. And I know there's a lot of people listening who aren't sure of that. And I'm sure it's very comforting for them to know that it could take some time to figure out what you're here to do. But where you are right now is helping to carve you into that person who does do what it is that they love to do. So thank you for that, Mike. Thank you, Brandon. I, I got to tell you, I thoroughly enjoy, first of all, talking with you in general, but just that I'm humbled and happy to have the opportunity to be on the program, kind of share my unique point of view on it, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's not scientific. It's like I said, human nature and common sense, but business, small businesses, once they figure this out, everything becomes easier. And if I can make it easier for people like me to do what they want to do and do what they believe in, then you know, your vision is not point A to point B and it's a straight line and you're just going to get there. It's made up of a bunch of stepping stones and it creates a parabola. And mm -hmm. each of those steps becomes important in how you're building your business. If you can get your audience connection right first, those steps become less steep and less frequent. Amen, brother. And thank you for bringing us through the framework and sharing a lot of the, the gems that will allow these business owners and coaches, consultants to make that happen. So thank you for your time, Mike, and for all your wisdom, my friend. Thank you, Brandon. And I'll, I'll talk to you very soon, I'm sure. Sounds great. What a conversation talking about branding, but more so diving in and talking about the connection that you have with the people that you most want to reach and impact. And like Mike said, the quality of your message is determining the quality of the results that you're getting for yourself, your business, but most importantly, for the lives of the people you're reaching. Mike shared a lot of his framework in this episode. Guys, go rewind it, watch it through and through and through. And once you've done that, click the link in the description to go to verrettandassociates.com to set up a free clarity call with Mike to talk about your business, to talk about your audience, to talk about what you're looking to achieve there so he can help you to finally tune that and craft that message. For those who found value from this episode, and Joe Gonzalez, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for being with us the entire time. For those who found value, share this with one person who could use the advice and the wisdom that Mike shared with us today. That way it can help them to do the same thing for their personal life, professional life, and their business as well. Just share this episode with one person. As always, thank you for being here and tuning in. And until we talk again next time, continue to be better.